Chapter Six, Book Three of Rookwood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Paul Curran. Rookwood by William Harrison Ainsworth. Book Three, Chapter Six. Eleanor Mowbray. Mischiefs are like the visits of Franciscan friars. They never come to prey upon us single. Devil's Law Case The course of our tale returns now to Eleanor Mowbray. After she had parted from Ranulph Rookwood, and had watched him disappear beneath the arches of the church porch, her heart sank, and drawing herself back within the carriage, she became a prey to the most poignant affliction. In vain she endeavoured to shake off this feeling of desolation. It would not be. Despair had taken possession of her. The magic fabric of delight melted away, or only gleamed to tantalise at an unreachable distance. A presentiment that Ranulph would never be hers had taken root in her imagination, and overshadowed all the rest. While Eleanor pursued this train of reflection, the time insensibly wore away until the sudden stoppage of the carriage aroused the party from their meditation. Major Mowbray perceived that the occasion of the halt was the rapid advance of a horseman, who was nearing them at full speed. The appearance of the rider was somewhat singular, and might have created some uneasiness as to the nature of his approach, had not the Major immediately recognised a friend. He was, nevertheless, greatly surprised to see him, and turned to Mrs. Mowbray to inform her that Father Ambrose, to his infinite astonishment, was coming to meet them, and appeared from his manner to be the bearer of unwelcome tidings. Father Ambrose was, perhaps, the only being whom Eleanor disliked. She had felt an unaccountable antipathy towards him, which she could neither extirpate nor control, during their long and close intimacy. It may be necessary to mention that her religious culture had been in accordance with the tenets of the Romish church, in whose faith, the faith of her ancestry, her mother had continued, and that Father Ambrose, with whom she had first become acquainted during the residence of the family near Bordeaux, was her ghostly adviser and confessor. An Englishman by birth, he had been appointed pastor to the diocese in which they dwelt, and was, consequently, a frequent visitor almost a constant inmate of the chateau. Yet though duty and respect would have prompted her to regard the father with affection, Eleanor could never conquer the feelings of dislike and distrust which she had at first entertained towards him, a dislike which was increased by the strange control in which he seemed to hold her mother, who regarded him with a veneration approaching to infatuation. It was, therefore, with satisfaction that she bade him adieu. He had, however, followed his friends to England under a feigned name, as, being a recusant Romish priest, and supposed to have been engaged in certain Jesuitical plots, his return to his own country was attended with considerable risk, and had now remained domesticated with them for some months. That he had been in some way, in early life, connected with a branch of the house of Rookwood, Eleanor was aware. She fancied he might have been engaged in political intrigue with Sir Reginald, which would have well accorded with his ardent, ambitious temperament, and the knowledge of this circumstance made her doubly apprehensive, lest the nature of his present communication should have reference to her lover, towards whose cause the father had never been favourable, and respecting whose situation he might have made some discovery, which she feared he might use to Ranulph's disadvantage. Wrapped in a long black cloak, with a broad-brimmed hat drawn closely over his brows, it was impossible to distinguish further of the priest's figure and features beyond the circumstance of his height, which was remarkable, until he had reached the carriage window, when, raising his hat, he disclosed a head that Titian might have painted, and which, arising from the dark drapery, looked not unlike the visage of some grave and saturnine Venetian. There was a venerable expanse of forehead, thinly scattered with hair, towering over black penthouse-like brows, which, in their turn, shadowed keen, penetrating eyes. 
the temples were hollow, the blue veins might be traced beneath the sallow skin, the cheekbones were high, and there was something in the face that spoke of self-mortification, while the thin, livid lips, closely compressed, and the austere and sinister expression of his countenance, showed that his self-abasement, if he had ever practised it, had scarcely prostrated the demon of pride, whose dominion might still be traced in the lines and furrows of his haughty physiognomy. The father looked at Mrs. Mowbray, and then glanced suspiciously at Eleanor. The former appeared to understand him. "'You would say a word to me in private?' said Mrs. Mowbray. "'Shall I descend?' The priest bowed assent. "'It is not to you alone that my mission extends,' said he gravely. "'You are all in part concerned. "'Your son had better alight with you.' "'Instantly,' replied the Major. "'If you will give me your horse in charge to the postillion, "'we will attend you at once.' "'With a feeling of renewed apprehension, "'connected she knew not why with Ranulph, "'Eleanor beheld her relatives descend from the carriage, "'and in the hope of gaining some clue from their gestures "'to the subject of the conversation,' she watched their motions as narrowly as her situation permitted. From the earnest manner of the priest, and the interest his narrative seemed to excite in his hearers, it was evident that his communication was of importance. Presently, accompanied by Father Ambrose, Mrs. Mowbray returned to the carriage, while the major, mounting the priest's horse, after bidding a hasty adieu to his sister, adding with a look that belied the consolation intended to be conveyed by his words that, all was well, but without saying to offer her any explanation of the cause of his sudden departure, rode back the way they had just traversed, and in the direction of Rookwood. Bereft of the only person to whom she could have applied for information, though dying with curiosity and anxiety to know the meaning of this singular interview, and the sudden change of plans which she felt so intimately concerned herself, Eleanor was constrained to preserve silence, as, after their entrance to the carriage, her mother again seemed lost in painful reflection, and heeded her not, and the father, drawing from his pocket a small volume, appeared intently occupied in its perusal. "'Dear mother,' said Eleanor, at length, turning to Mrs. Mowbray, "'my brother is gone.' "'To Rookwood,' said Mrs. Mowbray, in a tone calculated to check further inquiry, but Eleanor was too anxious to notice it. "'And wherefore, mother?' said she. May I not be informed? Not as yet, my child, not as yet, replied Mrs. Mowbray. You will learn all sufficiently early. The priest raised his cat-like eyes from the book to watch the effect of this speech, and dropped them instantly as Eleanor turned towards him. She had been about to appeal to him, but, having witnessed this look, she relinquished her scarce-formed purpose and endeavour to divide her tristful thoughts by gazing through the glimmering medium of her tears upon the soothing aspect of external nature, that aspect which, in sunshine or in storm, has ever relief in store for a heart embittered by the stormy coldness of the world. The road, meanwhile, led them through a long woody vale, and was now climbing the sides of a steep hill. They were soon in the vicinity of the priory, and of the gypsies' encampment, the priest leaned forward, and whispered something in Mrs. Mowbray's ear, who looked towards the ruined shrine, part of the mouldering walls being visible from the road. At that moment, the clatter of a horse's hoofs, and the sound of a loud voice commanding the postillion in a menacing tone to stop, accompanied by a volley of imprecations, interrupted the conference, and bespoke the approach of an unwelcome intruder, and one whom all, too truly, feared would not be readily dismissed. The postillion did his best to rid them of the assailant. Perceiving a masked horseman behind him, approaching at a furious rate, he had little doubt as to his intentions, and Turpin, for it was our highwayman, soon made his doubts certainties. He hallooed him to stop, but the fellow paid no attention to his command, and disregarded even the pistol which he saw, in a casual glimpse over his near side, presented at his person. Clapping spurs into his horse's flanks, he sought succour in flight. Turpin was by his side in an instant. As the highwayman endeavoured to catch his reins, the lad suddenly wheeled the carriage right upon him, 
and but for the dexterity of Turpin, and the clever conduct of his mare, would inevitably have crushed him against the roadside. As it was, his left leg was slightly grazed. Irritated at this, Turpin fired over the man's head, and with the butt-end of the pistol felled him from his seat. Startled by the sound, and no longer under the governance of their rider, the horses rushed with frantic violence towards a ditch that bounded the other side of the highway, down which the carriage was precipitated, and at once overturned. Turpin's first act, after he had ascertained that no mischief had been occasioned to those within, beyond the alarm incident to the shock, was to compel the postillion, who had by this time gained his legs, to release the horses from their traces. This done, with the best grace he could assume, and, adjusting his mask, he opened the carriage, and proceeded to liberate the captives. "'Beg pardon, ma'am,' said he, as soon as he had released Mrs. Mowbray, "'excessively sorry upon my soul to have been the cause of so much unnecessary alarm to you. All the fault, I assure you, of that rascal of a postillion. Had the fellow only pulled up when I commanded him, this botheration might have been avoided. You will remember that, when you pay him. All his faults, I assure you, ma'am.' Receiving no reply, he proceeded to extricate Eleanor, with whose beauty the inflammable highwayman was instantly smitten. Leaving the father to shift for himself, he turned to address some observation of coarse gallantry to her, but she eluded his grasp, and flew to her mother's side. "'It is useless, sir,' said Mrs. Mowbray, as Turpin drew near them, "'to affect ignorance of your intentions. You have already occasioned us serious alarm, much delay and inconvenience.' I trust, therefore, that beyond our purses, to which, though scantily supplied, you are welcome, we shall sustain no molestation. You seem to have less of the ruffian about you than the rest of your lawless race, and are not, I should hope, destitute of common humanity. "'Common humanity?' replied Turpin. "'Bless you, ma'am. I am the most humane creature breathing. Would not hurt a fly, much less a lady. Incivility was never laid to my charge. This business may be managed in a few seconds.' and as soon as we have settled the matter, I'll lend your stupid jack by a hand to put the horses to the carriage again, and get the wheels out of the ditch. You have a banker, ma'am, I suppose, in town, perhaps in the country, but I don't like country bankers. Besides, I want a little ready cash in Rumville, beg pardon, ma'am, London, I mean. My ears have been so stunned with those of Romany patterers, I almost think in flash. Just draw me a cheque. I've pen and ink always ready. A cheque for fifty pounds, ma'am, only fifty. "'What's your banker's name? "'I've blank checks all of the best houses in my pocket. "'And that, and a kiss from the pretty lips of that cherry-cheeked maid,' "'winking to Eleanor, will fully content me. "'You see, you have neither an exorbitant nor uncivil personage to deal with.' "'Eleanor shrank closer towards her mother, "'exhausted by previous agitation of the night, "'greatly frightened by the shock which she had just sustained.' and still more alarmed by the words and gestures of the highwayman, she felt that she was momentarily in danger of fainting, and with difficulty prevented herself from falling. The priest, who had succeeded in freeing himself from the carriage, now placed himself between Turpin and the ladies. "'Be satisfied, misguided man,' said the father, in a stern voice, offering a purse, which Mrs. Mowbray hastily extended towards him. "'With the crime you have already committed,' and seek not to peril your soul by deeper guilt. Be content with the plunder you now obtain, and depart. For by my holy calling, I affirm to you, that if you advance one footstep towards the further molestation of these ladies, it shall be at the hazard of your life. Bravo! exclaimed Turpin. Now this is what I like. Who would have thought that the old autumn baller had so much pluck in him? Sir, I commend you for your courage, but you are mistaken. I am the quietest man breathing, and never harm a human being. In proof of which, only look at your rascal of postillion, whom any one of my friends would have sent post-haste to the devil for half the trouble he gave me. Easy as I am, I never choose to be balked in my humours. I must have the fifty and the bus, and then I'm off, as soon as you like, and I may as well have the kiss while the old lady signs the cheque, and then we shall have the seal as well as a signature. Popo, no nonsense. Many a pretty lass has thought it an honour to be kissed by Turpin. Eleanor recoiled with deepest disgust, as she saw the highwayman thrust aside the useless opposition of the priest and approach her. He had removed his mask, 
His face, flushed with insolent triumph, was turned towards her. Despite the loathing which curdled the blood within her veins, she could not avert her eyes. He drew near her. She uttered a shrill scream. At that moment a powerful grasp was laid upon Turpin's shoulder. He turned and beheld Luke. "'Save me! Save me!' cried Eleanor, addressing the newcomer. "'Damnation!' said the highwayman. "'What has brought you here? One would think you were turned assistant to all distressed damsels. Quit your hold, or, by the God above us, you will repent it.' "'Fool!' exclaimed Luke. "'Talk thus to one who heeds you.' and as he spoke he hurled Turpin backwards with so much force that, staggering a few yards, the highwayman fell to the ground. The priest stood like one stunned with surprise at Luke's sudden appearance and subsequent daring action. Luke, meanwhile, approached Eleanor. He gazed upon her with curiosity mixed with admiration, for his heart told him she was very fair. A death-like paleness had spread over her cheeks, yet still, Despite the want of colour, she looked exquisitely beautiful, and her large blue eyes eloquently thanked her deliverer for her rescue. The words she wanted were supplied by Mrs. Mowbray, who thanked him in appropriate terms, when they were interrupted by Turpin, who had by this time picked himself up and was drawing near them. His countenance wore a fierce expression. "'I tell you what,' said he, "'Luke Bradley, or Luke Rookwood, or whatever else you may call yourself, you have taken a damned unfair advantage of me in this matter, and deserve nothing better at my hands than that I should call you to instant account for it, and curse me if I don't too. Luke Bradley, interrupted Mrs. Mowbray, are you that individual? I have been so called, madam, replied Luke. Father Ambrose, is this the person of whom you spoke? eagerly asked the lady. So I conclude, returned the priest evasively. "'Did he not call you Luke Rookwood?' eagerly demanded Eleanor. "'Is that also your name?' "'Rookwood is my name, fair cousin,' replied Luke, "'if I may venture to call you so.' "'And Ranulph Rookwood is—' "'My brother.' "'I never heard he had a brother,' rejoined Eleanor with some agitation. "'How can that be?' "'I am his brother nevertheless,' replied Luke moodily. "'His elder brother!' Eleanor turned to her mother and the priest with a look of imploring anguish. She saw a confirmation of the truth of this statement in their glances. No contradiction was offered by either to his statement. Both, indeed, appeared in some mysterious manner prepared for it. This, then, was the dreaded secret. This was the cause of her brother's sudden departure. The truth flashed with lightning swiftness across her brain. Chagrined and mortified, Luke remarked that glance of inquiry. His pride was hurt at the preference thus naturally shown towards his brother. He had been struck, deeply struck, with her beauty. He acknowledged the truth of Peter's words. Eleanor's loveliness was without parallel. He had seen naught so fair, and the instant he beheld her, he felt that for her alone could he cancel his vows to Sybil. The spirit of rivalry and jealousy was instantly aroused by Eleanor's exclamations. "'His elder brother!' echoed Eleanor dwelling upon his words and addressing Luke. "'Then you must be. But no, you are not. You cannot be. It is Ranulph's title. It is not yours. You are not.' "'I am Sir Luke Rookwood,' replied Luke proudly. Ere the words were uttered, Eleanor had fainted. "'Assistance is at hand, madam, if you will accept it and follow me,' said Luke, raising the insensible girl in his arms and bearing her down the hill towards the encampment whither he was followed by Mrs. Mowbray and the priest, between whom, during the hurried dialogue we have detailed, very significant glances had been exchanged. Turpin, who as may be supposed had not been an incurious observer of the scene passing, burst into his usual loud laugh on seeing Luke bear away his lovely burden. "'Cousin! ha 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 ha!' said he. "'So the wench is his cousin! Damn! I half suspect he has fallen in love with his new-found cousin! And if so, Miss Sybil, or I'm mistaken, will look as yellow as a guinea, if that little Spanish devil gets it into her pretty jealous pate that he's about to bring home a new mistress. We shall have a tragedy scene in the twinkling of a bedpost. However, I shan't lose sight of Sir Luke until I have settled my accounts with him. Hark ye, boy!' continued he addressing the postillion remain where you are you won't be wanted yet awhile i imagine there's a guinea for you 
to drink Dick Turpin's health, upon which he mounted his mare and walked her easily down the hill. "'And so that be Dick Turpin, folks talk so much about,' soliloquised the lad, looking curiously after him. "'Well, he's as civil speaking a chap as needs be. Blow my boots if he ain't. And if I'd a notion it were he, I'd a pulled up at first call without more ado. Nothing like experience. I shall know better another time.' added he, pocketing the ducheur. Rushing swiftly down the hill, Luke tarried at the river's brink, to sprinkle some of the cool element upon the pale brow of Eleanor, as he beheld her in his arms, thoughts which he fain would have stifled in their birth took possession of his heart. "'Would she were mine!' murmured he. "'Yet no, the wish is unworthy.' But that wish returned unbidden. Eleanor opened her eyes, she was still too weak to walk without support, and Luke, raising her once more in his arms, and motioning Mrs. Mowbray to follow, crossed the brook by means of stepping-stones, and conducted his charge along a by-path towards the priory, so as to avoid meeting with the crew assembled upon the green. They had gained one of the ruthless halls when he encountered Balthazar. Astonished at the sight of the party, the Patrico was about to address the priest as an acquaintance, when his more orthodox brother raised his finger to his lips in token of caution. The action passed unobserved. "'Hie thee to Sybil,' said Luke to the Patrico. "'Bid her haste hither. Say that this maiden, that Miss Mowbray is here, and requires her aid. Fly! I will bear her to the refectory.' As Balthazar passed the priest, he pointed with a significant glance towards a chasm in the wall, which seemed to be an opening to some subterraneous chamber, the father again made a gesture of silence, and Balthazar hastened upon his mission. Luke led them to the refectory. He brought a chair for Eleanor's support, but so far from reviving, after such attention as could be afforded her, she appeared to become weaker. He was about to issue forth in search of Sybil, when to his surprise he found the door fastened. "'You cannot pass this way,' said a voice, which Luke instantly recognised as that of the Knight of Malta. "'Not pass,' echoed Luke. "'What does this mean?' "'Our orders are from the Queen,' returned the knight. At this instant the low tone of a muffled bell was heard. "'Ha!' exclaimed Luke. "'Some danger is at hand.' His heart smote him as he thought of Sybil, and he looked anxiously towards Eleanor. Balthazar rushed into the room. "'Where is Sybil?' cried Luke. "'Will she not come?' "'She will be here anon,' answered the Patrico. "'I will seek her myself, then,' said Luke. "'The door by which you entered is free.' "'It is not free,' replied Balthazar. "'Remain where you are.' "'Who will prevent my going forth?' demanded Luke sternly. "'I will,' said Barbara Lovell, as she suddenly appeared in the doorway. "'You stir not, excepting at my pleasure. "'Where is the maiden?' continued she looking around with a grim smile of satisfaction at the consternation produced by her appearance. "'Ha! I see! She faints! Here is a cordial that shall revive her! Mrs. Mowbray, you are welcome to the gypsy's dwelling, you and your daughter, and you, Sir Luke Rookwood, I congratulate you upon your accession of dignity!' Turning to the priest, who was evidently overwhelmed with confusion, she exclaimed, "'And you too, sir!' Think you I recognize you not? We have met ere this at Rookwood. Know you not, Barbara Lovell? Ah, it is long since my poor dwelling has been so highly honoured. But I must not delay the remedy. Let her drink of this, said she, handing a file to Mrs. Mowbray. It will instantly restore her. It is poison, cried Luke. She shall not drink it. Poison, reiterated Barbara. Behold! And she drank of the liquid. I would not poison your bride, added she, returning to Luke. My bride? echoed Luke. Ay, your bride, repeated Barbara. Luke recoiled in amazement. Mrs. Mowbray almost felt inclined to believe she was a dreamer, so visionary did the whole scene appear. A dense crowd of witnesses stood at the entrance. Foremost amongst them was the sexton. Suddenly a shriek was heard and the crowd opening to allow her passage, Sybil rushed forward. End of chapter 6, book 3